Grab your Bibles. If you don't have one, there's some right in front of you in the chair uh, back right underneath, right in front of you. Uh, Turn to Matthew chapter 2. We are in a series um, that is called Finding Hope, and we are finding hope by following Jesus around the Gospel of Matthew. And so we're going to be here for a while, uh, a long while, uh, because you're catching our pace. And I don't know about you, but I'm having fun. You guys having fun with this little series? Um, so we're, we're actually going almost phrase by phrase, word by word, uh, through the Gospel of Matthew and catching this. So last week was Christmas. This is kind of Christmas 2.0 uh, this morning when we talk about these wise guys who find Jesus. And here, here's the temptation for you. You're going to be tempted to check out because you're going to go, I've heard this before. It's been a Christmas message. Uh, we've talked about the wise men at some point around your Christian journey, maybe if you're around the church and you have grown up around the church, have been around Christmas services, and, and I just want to encourage you to not check out, because there might be some new information, uh, and that's good, because you need information for transformation. You need information for transformation, but, but don't just let it be new information. You're going, oh, that's cool. I didn't know that before, but, but maybe chew on it and go, man, God, what do you want to do to change my heart as a result? So we're in Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Bless you. Not just because you sneeze. Bless you. Okay. So, so after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, uh, catch that phrase, Bethlehem in Judea, it's going to show up again and again. During the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw this star when it rose and have come to worship him. Verse 3, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of law, and he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In, here it is again, Bethlehem in Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophet has written. Micah said, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for, no, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel, predicted long before that there would be a Messiah born in Bethlehem in the land of Judea. Verse 7, Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he went and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child as soon as you find them, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Liar. <laughs> nope, that's not what he wanted to do. Verse 9, after they had heard the king, uh, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. And they bowed down and they worshipped him. Father, I ask that you would do something special in our hearts this morning. Would you help us to see something new through the power of your Holy Spirit? Would you change our hearts? Help us to be better worshipers as a result of this morning. We love you. Thank you for this story. Thank you for reminding us about it. Thank you for including it in Matthew's gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to give you the big picture first. I mean, we were in chapter 2. We're speeding along quite rapidly, aren't we? And so we're going at a good pace. Chapter 1 is all about the family tree of Jesus. We went through all those names, and we, we talked about that. Not all of them, but I highlighted a few. But we talked about how important that family tree is in the narrative. You get to chapter 2, now Jesus is a toddler. I'm throwing you off. All of your manger scenes, you have plenty of time before Christmas to go maybe take a few things out because they're not there. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. But he's not a baby anymore because when the wise men, the magi show up, I'll show you in a little while that he's a, he's a small child now and it's really going to mess with you maybe and everything you've been taught and everything you have maybe in your house or your dorm room or wherever that is. And so Bethlehem in Judea shows up in verse 2, verse 5, verse 6. And he's, he's going to tell us the story about Jesus. And, and Matthew is making this point. He wants us to know, well, I want to show you a map on the screen. And here it is. It's kind of small, but you see the yellow up there is the Galilee. That's the area around the Sea of Galilee. You see the little blue up there? That's the Sea of Galilee. And the area where Jesus did most of his ministry. He, he stayed in Capernaum. 
and he'd probably stay with Peter. And we've been there, I've been there now. And so literally, a stone's throw away from the synagogue is Peter's house. And so Jesus might have stayed there with Peter up there and did most of his ministry out of Capernaum, right there on the Sea of Galilee up there. He called the disciples up there and all that. So here's, here's the catch-22, that Matthew knew that the readers, when they heard this, this manuscript read in community at the beginning of the launch of the church, Matthew knew he had some explaining to do because the Messiah was supposed to be and was born further down south near in Bethlehem. It's sort of the center of the map underneath the word Judah, Jerusalem, and Bethlehem close by, down there. And so everybody knew that Jesus spent most of his ministry up north, but he was born down south in God's divine providence and to fulfill prophecies. So you catch the map of what's going on, and this is why Matthew makes a big deal about that phrase, uh, Bethlehem in Judea. Because everybody knew, every good Jew knew that this Messiah had to be born there and not up north. So God in His plan would, would arrange this thing. And so Galilee uh, and Judea, two different places, separated by Samaria, separated by the Gentiles, the, the, the people in between, if you will, the half-breeds. And, and Galilee is, is not even close to the temple in Jerusalem, but Bethlehem is. And so it gets really strategic on where he was born. Another little interesting thing is the Galileans up there, they had a bit of an accent. It would be like a Texan showing up in Manhattan. So now you read the Scriptures differently, and you know from some of the Scriptures and the Gospel writers say that, that we, you're not from here. Well, how do they know that? Not just because of their looks, but because of their words. They went, well, you got like a little accent. We know where you're from up there. And so Jesus would have had a little accent. Because most of his time was up there, and I'll bet he had the same accent as them. But if, so he went down to Jerusalem, they would have gone, you're not from around here, are you? So Matthew had some explaining to do to say, no, th this, this Messiah was born where you are in Bethlehem. But most of his ministry was up north. So Matthew's doing a little bit of apologetics here. He's defending the faith. He, he, he's saying to this primarily Jewish audience in the beginning of the launch of the church, Hey, I want you guys to understand that this is all going to make sense. And so he lays it out to them on why this makes sense. He's defending their faith and where Jesus would be coming from. He, he's, not just, you know, he's not just saying this is true. He's actually even saying that it works. Because most people today, let's just be honest, most people today, they don't care about truth or a truth, whether it's capital T or small t. They, they want to know that something works. Because they want to feel good about it. They want it to feel good, right? That's our world, isn't it? Everything, everybody is, is running after things that feel good, that have a good experience attached to them. That, and, and it's no different in the church to some degree. And, and so they, they want, they want to, it's not just about what is true, like, like prove it to me, Matthew, that this apologetics and prophecy and everything lines up as true, which it did. But Matthew is also saying that this whole faith in Jesus thing, this following him, works for your life. Because if he is indeed the Messiah, it's going to work with your relationship with the one true God. It's going to work as you work out your relationships with people. It's going to work out. And so Matthew is making this big point. I want to really quickly go through the timeline of what's happened so far and what's going to come. Because some of you may have the timeline or been taught some things that, that are a little bit different than, than maybe what the Bible actually lays out. So I'm going, to, I'm going to share really quick the timeline of what the order of events of what happened. Because it's super important for you to know this. So a Roman census breaks out. They count people. And so you have to go to the town where, where you're from. And Mary and Joseph, they travel to Nazareth. And to, from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And so they go to Bethlehem and Jesus is born there. And, and Jesus on the eighth day is circumcised. He's, he's been born. He's a little boy. He now is going to go be circumcised just like according to the law, probably at a local synagogue. Or, or he, he, like John the Baptist, had somebody come to him to be circumcised. You can read about that later. And notice then, uh, according to the law of Leviticus, chapter 12, is that for 40 days, the woman, after giving birth, needed to have some time go by for purification. It's all laid out there. If you want to read about it in your quiet time, Luke, Leviticus chapter 12, probably don't, but there it is. And so Mary and Joseph, most likely, would have, would have waited a little while before they went to the temple 
and offered the sacrifice, and you know the story, they're poor. So they offer, you know, two pigeons or two doves, what a poor person would, not, not a larger animal, because they didn't have any money, which is more proof that the wise men had not come yet. They'd not come yet because they provided some, some money for them, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which a lot of people believe uh, actually financed them to be able to get to Egypt. But they haven't, don't have it yet, so they go to the temple 40 days later, um, because they, they were good Jews, and, and they went at the right time. And Bethlehem is not too far away from Jerusalem, and so they, they made that journey to the temple to do that thing. Um, then the family re- returned to, to Bethlehem, I believe, before, before all this, and then here come the wise men. And so by now, Jesus is one, one and a half years old, but definitely under two. Why under two? Because Herod actually slaughters all those little boys who are under two because he's paranoid. We'll get to him in a minute. But the wise men show up and they worship him and they give him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. By the way, we don't know how many wise men. We assume it was three. Could have been less, could have been more. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But they worship the Christ child. They worship because they, they realize to some degree in their understanding that this is, this is the Messiah of the Jews, and we get it, and they supernaturally saw the star. We'll talk about that in just a minute, too. But then the Magi returned to their homeland via a different route as they were directed supernaturally. And that's the order of how things took place. So let's talk about some main characters really fast. Number one, let's talk about Herod. Let's talk about Herod. You have a little fun with the history buffs that are here. Sixty years before Jesus was born, this Roman general Pompey, you remember his name? Pompey, some movies about him, conquered Jerusalem and Palestine, and he set up some local leaders, and one of them was Herod, also known as Herod the Great, also known as Herod the Builder, because he built a lot of things. And so he sets up, he, he's over this particular area, and uh, There's more historical evidence I have read this week about Herod, King Herod, than there even are about Jesus, than there even are about Alexander the Great, than there even are about other rulers in our history. More about this guy because because Josephus, the historian, wrote a lot down about Herod and all these details. And so so it's amazing. We, We have lots and lots of details historically about this guy. So I want to tell you a little bit about him because because he is paranoid. He is he's a narcissist to the extreme. This Herod, Herod the Great, was also had the title King of the Jews. And so you can already see there's a little conflict being set up. When all of a sudden now the word gets to him that, that this little baby is, is going to be born and, and he immediately runs to all those Jewish uh, well, religious leaders and people that would know prophecy to figure out what's the time, where's the place, what happened. Because if another king, you know, there's no, going to be no competition with me, I will take them out. And so this is the Herod. He was a builder. He built the second temple. He expanded to it, made it bigger and larger and just to, for him, to show it off to him. He, he, he built the Caesarea on the, on the coast, which is most of where the military came from, headed towards Jerusalem during Passover. He, he, he built the, the fortress in Masada, if you've read about that battle in history. He, he built a lot of different things. It took a lot of different time. But he was also brutal. He's pure evil on earth, this Herod. I mean, let me just give you a little context. He's, he killed three of his own sons. Why? Because he was threatened by them. Had them terminated. He killed his favorite wife. He had ten, but he killed his favorite. Why? Because he thought she was just talking behind his back about him. He, he killed his mother-in-law. I'm not going to say a word about that. He killed the high priest, cousins. He, he, he even talked about a rumor that he was going to kill a bunch of Jews in a stadium, kind of like, kind of like what Rome would be like. I mean, he, he, he is brutal. This is the Herod we're talking about. This is the Herod who set this stuff up. And, and so the Herod's troubled by the news that there's a king born. And, and then all of Jerusalem, and, and I believe it's because they heard, they, they were curious about what is Herod going to do about this? So all of Jerusalem, like rumor is spread. Is it possible the Messiah is being born? Is it possible? And then the ripple effect throughout all of Jerusalem, like what is Herod going to do about this? Because we, we know his reputation. We know what he does to people that he's threatened by. And then verse 4, chapter 2, verse 4, is he kept on asking the wise men, 
in the original language, there's a paranoia here where he keeps asking, and keeps asking, and keeps asking, where is he, where is he, where is he, what time, what time, when was the star, what was it? What did you do? tell me everything, tell me everything, because he's totally paranoid that there might be another king who's been born that's in competition with him. And all these priests, these, these, these high priests and, and teachers of the law, they would bring out the scroll and they turn to Micah chapter 2, verses 5 and 6 that Matthew just quoted. And they would say that, this, that he's going to be born in this Bethlehem of Judea and at this time and he's going to be the king of the Jews. And so, man, just, just think about this guy. Just think about for just a moment King Herod versus King Jesus. Just for a moment, King Herod is this illegitimate human king that uses power to stay in his position. He, he takes out anybody, literally. It's worse than the, the worst movie that you would see today. He, he horrifically killed people because he just had this smell of threat that they would take over his kingdom. Not Jesus. Jesus is the total opposite. He comes in as an infant, humble. <laughs> he, he comes in as a servant leader. He, he says, you want to be great? Serve people. You want to be great on the corporate ladder? Come down and serve and love people. Total opposite. It reminds me, and forgive the illustration, but it's just true, is there's this show a while back before President Trump called The Apprentice. You remember that show? And uh, The Apprentice, the whole point of The Apprentice, and this is not a reflection politically, and this is not a reflection about Trump. I'm just saying the show. The show was all about leadership, and you could do whatever you wanted to to get to the top and win. You could lie, cheat, steal. You could do whatever you want on the show. I don't know if you noticed this or not, but there, there, wasn't no, there was no integrity line on The Apprentice. And so we watched it a few times, and that famous, you know, you're fired and all that stuff going on. But, but it's, it's the world's example of how to do leadership, to be honest with you, as opposed to the way Jesus did it. It reminded me when I was growing up playing King on the Mountain at recess. Remember that game? And there's the snow pile in Michigan, and it, the elementary school and junior high would come out there. I see that hand, Tim. And, it's just, you know, and, and we, we climb up to the top. You tackle people off the top. The girls tend to stay away. The guys are there. We bring our snow suits and stuff and recess, take it out until one day I take Scott off the, off the thing, and he turns around and comes up swinging at me. And I swing back, and we end up in the principal's office. And it's like that is the world's way of doing leadership by power and control, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this thing by force. Jesus, total opposite. I mean, he comes in with, uh, man, just, just, just this gentle, humble, uh, I mean, a baby is born and he threatens the whole world. What in the world? That is crazy. And Herod's paranoid about a baby being born. It's nuts. I mean, Jesus was born into a war zone, everybody. Jesus was not born like we see in these scenes and in the great feelings we have around Christmas and the great movies that we watch. He's not born into this peaceful, oh, everything's quiet and there's background music playing in the manger. No. No, I remember growing up with our manger scenes and the wise men were there and you probably had them too and here were all the, everybody there. I'd play with them growing up and there's baby Jesus and I've watched my kids do the same thing and then I'm a, I'm a, I'm a guy so, so then I, I, all of a sudden Star Wars guys would end up in the manger scene and, and, and army guys would end up in the manger scene and mix and match and everything and playing together and I'm thinking that is a more accurate picture of the manger scene than just sitting up there on the shelf all by themselves. I mean, there, there, there ought to be Herod's soldiers in the manger scene. There ought to be th this presence, this war zone coming because, because these soldiers are there. Because the contrast of Herod and Jesus could not be more drastic. Evil king wants to destroy Jesus coming to bring peace. As a matter of fact, Luke's gospel tells us that the, when, the, when the shepherds got the word, it, they, they sang and, and it was like peace is coming into the world through, through this Messiah Jesus. And so... That's exactly what he does, but it's evil exists there. And, and so here, here's a question for you to get personal, and forgive me for stepping on your toes for a moment, but, 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 but we're born hostile towards God. We, we, we have a sinful nature that's born, and, and you just know it intuitively, but you, you, you're born into a world where you're not for God, you're actually against God until he takes hold of your life. And then all of a sudden, he changes you and he changes your heart and he forgives your sin. And, and all of a sudden, now you can have right relationship with him. But before that happens, we, we, are, we are like Herod. 
born into this world where, where Jesus is, 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 is a hostile person who, who, di- who, who disrupts things and, and tries to take over my life. And I don't want him to in certain areas. Do you? I mean, do you want him to take over every area of your life? Or are you threatened and like, man, I don't want him to really talk about that with me. I don't really want him to go there with me. I did, but Jesus comes in peacefully, drawing people to himself. He doesn't force himself on anybody like Herod does. And all Jesus is saying, I've shown you this before, but, it, but it's like a lot of people consider the word of God and what Jesus has to say. But, but, they, but, but they don't come under it and submit to it. So they consider it, they, they read it, and they, they, they're on the journey, they're trying to figure this thing out, but they don't come underneath of it, submitting to it, and because, because there are areas where it's like, man, I don't know if I really want him to be king of that area of my life. But Jesus is in the business of, through grace and love and gentleness and drawing and peace, to say, no, come follow me. I'm going down the right road, the road you want to go down with me, Herod, on the other hand, it's a threat. And I just go, man, there are moments where, if I'm just being honest, where I am more like Herod. And I think, well, of course, I wouldn't, want it. I wouldn't take anybody's life. Not that bad. But there are moments where it's like, man, this Jesus guy is kind of messing with me. This Jesus guy is, try, is, is talking about things in my life where I kind of want control of that area of my life rather than let him have control of it. Number two, the second group, we're going to talk about the magi, the magi, the wise guys. Uh, verse one, these wise men, these magi, they're probably Medes or Persians coming from the east over here. And, and they would have been guys that they were not kings. They weren't kings, even though we sing the, about them being kings. They're not kings. They're, they're Gentile astronom, astronomer, astrologers, mathematicians, scientists, truth seekers, or trying to look at the stars to figure out things. That's who these guys are. They're more, they're, you know, they're not Aragons, they're Gandalfs. They're a bunch of Gandalfs, really. I mean, and I, we don't know how many there were, but, but they're Gandalfs who, who seem to have this magic and this stuff, and they look at the stars and they know seasons and all this kind of thing going on. And this is the Magi. This is who they are. They, they're, they're Babylon, Persian, uh, the Medes, somewhere over there is where they came from. We don't know exactly for sure, and everybody argues about which one of those groups they came from. Well, it makes the most sense. But here, here they come, and, and it's amazing to me. Watch this. Watch this. This is, this is unbelievable. I don't know if you knew this, but in the Old Testament, it says that astrology is wrong. So like to base and worship things on creation of any sort is wrong, but, but it specifically talks about this. And in worshiping the stars or worshiping creation, that kind of thing. And so it's a direct hit against what the Magi, the wise men, are doing with their careers. And yet, God uses them and he directs what they know, a star supernaturally, and everybody debates about is it was an actual star, an angel, what? We don't know. But it moved, it moved, and he directs what they know best to move that to get their attention and then through supernatural means of angel, I mean, he, he supernaturally directs them to the Messiah of the world. Isn't that awesome? I mean, I, I just go, God, you're amazing. Because some people would go, wait a minute, I thought astrology was even mocked and forbidden in the Old Testament. And it is, to worship anything other than God. But God meets them right where they are, and he draws them in, and he uses it, to take them to exactly where they need to be. And then, and in essence, he, he, he funds Joseph and Mary's trip to Egypt and beyond based on those guys' gifts to the, to the king. And they come to worship him. And I find that just amazing that he would do that. So all throughout the Bible, God does that. Let me just give you one other example. Jonah. Jonah means swallowed by a big fish. Uh, why? It's more than just God in control and all that kind of thing, Jonah running away. It, it's because, well, those, those Ninevites back there, they worship this guy that looked like half a man and half a fish. It looked like a man coming out of a fish is who they worshiped. So how creative is God to actually have a man be spit out of a fish to make the point? Because no doubt, he would have shared that. So it's the same way. It's a, God meets people right where they are. Paul did it at Mars Hill. 
there if you've ever read that. Right? I see you unknown God because you get a whole bunch of them, and I'll tell you about the unknown God. It's the one true God to me. It's amazing. God does this over and over. He meets people right where they are, and then these guys, these wise men, are part of the story that told, they get this, this is the Messiah. They come to genuinely worship what they know at the time of this Messiah, of this one, and they follow God. They, they even follow God over following Herod because they, they, they don't go back to Herod, so they take a different route home. And, and so they actually follow God, and it's amazing to me how God just does that. He, he meets people who are far away from him right where they are, and then before you know it, they are part of the story. The part of the story of the birth of Jesus, I find that remarkable. He's born king of the Jews. And it's more accurately in verse 10, or verse 2, it's, it's born king. It's the king who was born is a more accurate interpretation of that phrase. Not, not born king of the Jews like it's an opinion, but like, no, he, he was, he was, he was bor- a born king. And as a result, people ought to worship him and love him and care for him. And they, and they came to the city of David to find the son of David. Because they, they'd read about it, they knew about it, and, and there they are. And so Jesus is for all people is what this is illustrating big time. Like, like, like put it in neon lights. Jesus came for the whole world. The whole genealogy, which we talked about a few weeks ago, lists all sorts of people from all different backgrounds, Gentiles, Jews, everybody corrupt, uh, doing better, you know, everybody. And this is just another living example of these wise men were Gentiles far away from God, but God used supernatural things to draw them in to follow and come to the Messiah. Finally, we get to number three, Jesus. Bless you. What about Jesus? What about Jesus? Je- Jesus is the Messiah. He's the deliverer of sins. He's the king of kings. He, he came. He's the promised king that came. And just examples so far in chapter one and chapter two. Watch this. So far, this is what Matthew says, so far about this being the one. This Jesus being the one. Chapter 1, verse 23, he's, a, he's born of a virgin. Check that off the box. That was predicted ahead of time. Uh, chapter 2, verse 6, Messiah from Bethlehem. Check that off the list. Uh, verse 15, he was, he's come back from Egypt. When he comes back, check that off the list. Uh, verse 18, Herod will try and kill the Messiah by killing the children. Check that off the list. Done. Verse 23, we'll get to, he will live in Nazareth. Check that off the list. I mean, the, the specific prophecies fulfilled just in chapter 1 and chapter 2 for this guy, Jesus, are unbelievable. And we haven't taught, I mean, that's just five. What are the odds that one guy would fulfill all of that right there? So Matthew is going on this bit of a apologetics, defend the faith with his Jewish friends saying, this is the one. This is the one. And Jesus, man, he confronts the powers of the world. I mean, as just this little baby or this child growing, the buzz around Jerusalem, could this be the guy? Could this be the one? It's amazing. Obviously, threatened to Herod, buzz across Jerusalem. I know toddlers tend to wreck homes, but man, Jesus came and wrecked the world. I mean, he just, just came and messed everything up for everybody. I mean, it's, it's amazing. He just, he just, just the word about Jesus. And so think about this with me. When, when they showed up, the wise men showed up, Jesus is saying some words. You ever thought about that before? One, one and a half years old, Jesus is saying some words. I don't know if he tried to repeat gold, frankincense, or myrrh. I don't know what that sounded like coming out of Jesus' mouth, but, but he, he, he's now a toddler. He's mobile. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, so they, there he is, and I, I'm sure he hugged and touched and came close to them when they came. It's amazing to me. It's amazing to me that G- Jesus brings a reaction. When Jesus shows up, it brings a reaction. When he showed up as a toddler and a baby, baby toddler, it brings a reaction. It brings a, re- a reaction to the whole world. He brings a reaction to us. I don't know if you knew this, but you know, Time Magazine puts out this list of the 100 top people in the world, that kind of thing. But there's another list, uh, the 100 people most powerful in the world who have lost their power. And uh, number one on the list was a guy named Tony Hayward, who is the former uh, CEO of BP Oil Company. You remember a little while ago, a little spill that BP had? Well, he went from like top CEO, he was the scapegoat of the company and crashed and burned. His reputation, I'll put on that. Or a guy named Jim Keyes, who was the CEO of Blockbuster. Anybody remember Blockbuster? Well, they went out of business because uh, we don't use VHS and CDs anymore for movies. 
So he kind of crashed and burned. Then a guy named Mike Jones is the CEO of MySpace. Anybody remember MySpace? 70 million users, but now this little thing called Facebook took over. So Mike Jones no more. Listen closely. I'm almost done. Listen closely. None of those people and everybody else on the 100 list wanted to lose their power. But Jesus did. You catching this? Jesus would leave heaven on purpose to come in the form of a baby, to lose power, to limit his power, Philippians says, to, to, to be like us, to relate to us, to be present with us. It's unbelievable to me that he would do that because you and I wouldn't do that. Well, who's going to leave heaven? If you get to heaven, you don't want to leave. I, I've heard, heard stories and talked to some of you about near-death experiences or people that actually have died and they see something. We don't know what that is, but, but if, they, if they indeed were like there and not there, it's like, why? Well, I don't want to leave. What in the world? That's crazy. But over and over and over again, we're going to find that Matthew is making this point over and over and over again that 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 he that this this Christ child is coming to save people and and, and he lose he loses some power in order to draw people closer to him. Bottom line is when you see Jesus, the wisest response is to worship him. That's what the wise men did. That's what we ought to do. Father, we just pray that you would help us to get as close to you as we can. Lord, this is a weird word to say, but if there's any hostility between us and you, would you help us to get it out of the way? It seems awfully drastic, but it's true. It's what Herod had against you. It's what our own hearts have against you when we don't know you as our Savior. We're hostile towards you. And Lord, man, as soon as we turn our backs on you in any area, that's what it's like. And yet you want to draw us back in. So Lord, if there's anything in our lives this morning that needs to get out of the way, so we worship you with all of our hearts, I pray that it would happen. In Jesus' name, amen.